Glenda Cox is a senior lecturer at Center for Innovation and Learning and Teaching. Her portfolio includes curriculum projects, teaching with technology, innovation grants, open education resources, and staff development. And her research has, over several years, focused on um, open education resources, staff development, and educator innovation. Her recently completed PhD um, focused on using social realism to explain why academic staff choose to contribute or not their teaching resources as OER. And her research draws on very rich and deep experience in staff development and partnership with educators. Without any further hesitation, it gives me great pleasure to hand over to Glenda Cox. Thank you so much, Tony. I hope that everybody can hear me clearly. Excellent. Okay, thank you, Tony, for the introduction. Um, Today, my presentation is mostly going to focus on the research that I did for uh, this, this project, Research on Open Education Resources for Development. So although uh, I would like to perhaps talk in future about my PhD work, uh, today I'll be really looking at some of the hopefully very useful findings and interesting findings that came out of this uh, Raw for d project. So uh, just uh, to those who I don't know in, in the room, um, that's what I look like. And uh, I have been involved in open education since 2010, uh, where I took over management of the UCT Open Content uh, Referatory at the time. Um, and more recently in 2014, that became um, a a repository called Open UCT. So I've been involved in that management process, training process, and advocacy. Uh, then my research is really focused around OER. So I, as Tony mentioned, I have been doing PhD work in, in open education resources, uh, quite a theorized approach to, to open education. And then I have been very privileged to be part of the Rule for D project. Uh, I am a sub-project leader. And so today I will be talking about some evidence from the Rule for D project, uh, looking at uh, OER adoption. And by the word adoption, I'm referring to contribution and use of OER. I'm going to talk about the OER adoption pyramid, which talks to both barriers and, in fact, enablers to OER. And I hope that that pyramid might be useful um, to all of you as you uh, consider moving into the world of OER. I want to talk a little bit about the benefits of OER and then a little bit about my own experience as an open education practitioner. So this amazing project that I was part of, um, I am a sub-project leader. Uh, there were 18 projects in total. I'll show you a little bit more about that in a moment. And essentially, I was trying to, attempting to understand lecturers' adoption of OER. And I did this work with my colleague, Henry Trotter, who unfortunately is traveling at the moment. Otherwise, I imagine he would be part of this presentation. So this phenomenal project um, goes across 26 countries, 16 time zones, and includes around about 100 researchers. So it really has been phenomenally interested to be part of this network um, of learners. And it's been of huge benefit for me professionally and academically. 
And the purpose of this Raw for D project was really to bring a Global South perspective and Global South research into the area of open education. So when we started out the project, it seemed that a lot of the empirical work had been done in, in, in the US perhaps or in Europe, um, in the UK, and there really wasn't a lot of evidence coming from the Global South. And, and that was the impetus to start looking at the impact of OER. Um, so there are a number of impact studies, but also the adoption of OER. So my study was centered in South Africa. And what uh, Henry and I did was we um, identified three institutions. One is our own institution, UCT, um, and the other two, the University of Fort Hare and the University of South Africa. So you will see on this table uh, a, a kind of number of aspects to these profiles. And we specifically chose quite different types of institutions in order to extend our kind of range of experience. So this was a purposeful sample and we really wanted to get at, at, at different different kinds of experiences. So for example at UCT we have to, around about 26,000 students. Uh, they are residential, we are a traditional research institution. Um, and then you'll see kind of towards the bottom of that list um, institutional culture and that was something that came across as being quite important um, and Henry and I have written about this and and presented on this um, um, in other places um, and I will refer give you a link to that at the end of the presentation uh, and also very importantly this idea of copyright owner of teaching materials and this is perhaps something in the institutions where you are from uh, you might want to really truly understand the co copyright and the copyright of your institution and just what rights you actually have and you will see here interestingly enough that UCT um, allows lecturers to have copyright over their own teaching materials whereas um, the University of Forte and the University of UNISA, um, the, the copyright of materials is held within the institution. And this is important, um, and you'll see in the pyramid a little bit later, uh, that uh, it's, it's a little bit about agency. So UCT lecturers have agency, whereas at Forte and UNISA, it's in fact the institution that holds agency and control over resources. Just a tiny bit about the methodology. This was mostly a qualitative research, although we also did a survey. Um, and it was also a, a real attempt to, to do some sort of development work. So this entire project, which I've omitted to say, which I should have said right in the beginning, was fun was funded uh, primarily by the IDRC, um, a Canadian institute that funds research and development work. So uh, the workshops that we conducted at the other two institutions, um, we're hoping were, were beneficial to those who attended and made them aware of OER and Creative Commons. And while we visited the universities, we interviewed um, six academics. So what we found, uh, interestingly enough, when we look at this grid, is that in fact, the people that we interviewed, only two were adopting OER. We only had two academics who were both contributing and using OER. And this uh, was, I suppose, a little bit disappointing to us in a way. Um, I think we had hoped that there would be more OER activity, but as researchers do, because we found this, we thought, ah, okay, well, we need to explain um, this gap, uh, this, uh, this area where clearly we, we need to understand and get to grips with why uh, academics are not adopting OER. 
We also did a little survey, as I mentioned, with, um, and we had 18 participants in that. And again, so that was extended out a little bit further than our interview participants. And here also, um, very little contribution of OER and, and um, some use, but, but certainly less uh, than expected. So after having a look at our data, having a look at the analysis, uh, doing these in-depth interviews that covered a whole realm um, of questions around OER activity, we started to see that there really were these factors that needed to be in place to enable OER. So these factors are um, both barriers and enablers to OER. And my colleague Henry came up with this amazing uh, graphic so that it could be a little bit easier for people to access this pyramid and access this idea and, and hopefully uh, something quite valuable for you to take back to your institution. Um, and, and even as an individual to actually look at these different layers and, and see where you fit in and perhaps what might be holding you back. Uh, you can see on the left hand side um, this idea of externally determined and internally determined as you move up the pyramid um, and also on either side the notion of agency that I mentioned earlier. So individuals may be agents of OER but then again institutions may be agents of OER. So if I can run through these uh, these different layers uh, briefly, uh, although we have certainly elaborated on them in much more detail in a paper that will be coming out this year. So uh, the most basic and fundamental area is access. And this is, in, is certainly something that is a big barrier in the Global South. It might not be as much of a barrier in the Global North where infrastructures are in place and internet connectivity and electricity are kind of given day-to-day um, -day experience. So access is very important. The next level is permission and I mentioned this earlier. Do you have permission to share um, or use OER according to your institutional IP policy? The next level is awareness and we found, especially at the University of Forte, very little awareness of OER and what could be done with OER. And I think globally, and, and we found in the Global South, and in our experience in South Africa, awareness is still relatively low. Um, and something as advocates we could be working on. Then capacity. And this talks a little bit um, to the work of Catherine Cronin. Uh, who I know many of you were listening to on Tuesday, not all of you. So um, what capacity talks about is, is, a, is around those digital skills uh, that people, um, academics, lecturers, um, students will need to be able to use and create and find OER. So it, those digital abilities are very important. Then above that, we also found Academics often referred to the fact that they might have looked for OER but could not find any OER that was relevant for them or had concerns around the quality of the OER that they found. And then at the very top of the triangle is this idea of volition. So the, all these components at the bottom, if they're all in place, you still need personal or institutional volition. So you can, I hope that that kind of explains how this triangle fits together and that this volition piece is at the top of the triangle and specifically the volition piece is what I looked at in my PhD. Um, and just to get into volition, this is the work from Henry and I, not from the, my PhD, but this idea of agency and volition is extremely important in your own personal work. If you have all those other aspects in place, 
you still need to be ready to make the shift to be open, uh, to open up your work. And you might be influenced by the institution or your social department or disciplinary norms. These might be things that concern you, or you might have very personal individual values or deeper concerns that enable you and make you feel that you really do want to share. So this volition triangle is also a complex triangle in itself. Okay. So that was the OER um, adoption pyramid. And I hope that that will be um, a useful framework that you can work with and, and perhaps take into your own research. Uh, and yeah, I hope that it will, it will um, open up opportunities for you to actually analyze your situation, whether it's OER readiness in your institution or personal readiness. So in our interviews, we asked a number of other, I think, interesting questions. And one of them that I wanted to highlight, and I thought that perhaps this could be something we could talk about um, later in our discussion. Because we were quite concerned, are there specific challenges of OER use in the Global South? Is there something different going on in the Global South? Uh, and and hi and and what do our participants what were their sort of personal views on on these challenges? So we we saw the challenges in the pyramid, but we also specifically addressed this question. And um, here are some of the results from from that. And hopefully they'll um, spark some some discussion later. So besides the triangle. Uh, challenges that we've discussed. Um, there were other issues that came up that might be quite interesting uh, for you to consider. So um, language came up um, three times, and I think this is a big issue um, to using OER, especially when it's not in your own language. Uh, there was talk about schooling, so preparing students to come into the university in a particular way where they have the digital school skills um, and, the, and the critique of resources that their students themselves are not um, prepared adequately for higher education. Then, uh, ideas of this, the fact that perhaps this would just be more content from white Western academics so a general kind of feeling of resistance to more resources coming in from the north um, and not from the global south. Then developing country people actually think their stuff is not good enough. And this, I don't feel, is a, is a unique to global south um, aspect at all. There are a number of academics um, who really feel their work is not good enough. And it's a complex and interesting um, acknowledgement that I explored a little bit further in my PhD. So I won't get into it now, but perhaps you might um, agree with this, this idea. Then there would need to be a change of mindset. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this idea of changing pedagogy, changing how you approach your teaching and how you approach openness um, and this um, tension between um, this idea of privacy and openness. Then other academics mentioned a fear of being critiqued and critiquing others. Um, yeah, that might resonate. And then um, an idea of more of a simplistic adoption without a critical stance. And I think that also might be, from what I've heard from researchers globally, often OER are simply used as they are. Uh, not necessarily adapted and changed for the circumstances. Uh, more positive comments. Um, so one, increase the base of knowledge, capital, in the African context. And I think later on I'm also going to repeat this idea of the importance of, of us, of as Africans, speaking as an African, that we must create our resources that are useful for our context. Um, and then also this idea of 
um, people being very creative in dire circumstances. And yes, we know we don't have great access. So we need to think of different ways of getting OERs out there, uh, whether it's on a mobile phone or whether it's downloaded um, onto a hard drive that uh, students can use without an internet access. So we need to also be creative about how we can share OER. Um, and then to move on to this idea of an open educational practitioner um, and what it means. So this is kind of a, a kind of shift in the conversation now onto, onto this kind of second part that I wanted to talk about a little bit. Um, also just to open up hopefully some some comments and conversation. So I thank you very much, Catherine. I have used your um, very thorough definition um, of open educational practices. And I really like the way that you've combined this idea of creation and use, but also really looking at pedagogical um, practices um, and how those can really change through the use of OER. Um, and this idea of social networks and interaction, peer learning and knowledge sharing. So I feel it's an incredibly thorough and very, very useful definition. And the link that I have placed in the slide is the link to Catherine's um, article on this work. So if you're interested in exploring it further, I highly recommend that you read that. And then below it is um, Professor Martin Weller's uh, definition. Um, and his work uh, is always on the cutting edge. Um, and he, I don't think he's here, and <laughs> just checking, um, he has a wonderful blog that is worth reading called um, Ed Techie. And uh, he blogs regularly um, and uh, it, always about um, the newest, most interesting uh, debates in open education. And he's um, Definition is very much more open, uh, but talks about a change in educational practice. Um, and I, I think that you know this also speaks to Catherine's definition. There are a number of definitions, uh, a range of definitions. So I, I do feel that it's it's also up to you as an academic, as a lecturer, to explore these definitions and find one that particularly works for you. Uh, here is, is Catherine's model um, that she has developed through her PhD work. And I, I have not used this model in my work, and I think I would like to be able to explore the raw for d um, work a little bit further, and also my own PhD work, having a look at these four dimensions that Catherine has developed. And instinctively looking at them and looking at what I know from my research, uh, I feel that this model is particularly thorough uh, um, and very useful to apply to, to work that we already have. Uh, and I particularly like the idea of this inner circle of networked individuals, but then extending out into networked educators. So I know Catherine explained this in quite a bit of detail in her in her slides. So why adopt OER um, and or open education practices? I think I probably need to move along, so I'm going to try and get through this last bit a little quicker. Uh, this slide uh, I think we're all kind of aware of all these global challenges in higher education, increasing cost increasing demand, increasing competition, variable quality, and also these asymmetrics of power and wealth and curriculum from the global north, favored over the global south. So these are the global challenges. So this is one very good reason um, to start thinking about putting our African content um, out there and sharing our African knowledge. And so I particularly like this idea of, of African content to the rest of the world. I won't go into this list in detail. You're welcome to refer back to this at some point. When I talk about advocacy work, there are a number of reasons why academics should uh, consider um, moving into the area of adopting OER. 
um, and they're around visibility, around social responsi responsiveness. Um, there are strategic reasons around improving recruitment um, and coherence across courses. And on, on an individual level, profiling your teaching and your pedagogical area, a record of your teaching, fostering connections, increasing impact and extending use. And perhaps this slide might also provoke um, some conversation around how this fits in with perhaps what Catherine has found in her work. And the steps to becoming an open education practitioner? Well, I, I don't think it's a step-by-step -step, uh, process, but um, I just have a couple of suggestions. Um, so it's about changing pedagogy. And this little slide here, this little illustration of of a, tea, of a teacher. Um, so the idea behind this slide is that we're no longer, we are freed up by the internet. We don't have to just teach in our classroom. We can now extend our teaching beyond the classroom. And yes, there are constraints that we found around this. So sometimes people have these interactive teaching styles that do not always result in these Perfect online materials that can be easily shared as OER. So that I found was a barrier. Um, and then also it is difficult to find relevant OER. Um, so that is also a barrier to use. Uh, then just one or two more slides to finish off. Um, so just to think about your online presence. And I'm going to give myself, um, now the, these are examples from my own practice. And it's taken quite a while for me to get there. And some of it's pretty scary stuff. Uh, so one of the things uh, that uh, we did in the research in the Raw for D project was to make our data available. And this is, was a first experience for me and really quite a complex process of de-identifying to ensure that um, the participants were protected and it was quite a bit of work to actually think about this and go through this process of open data. And part of the Raw for Deep um, project, we've learned a lot about open data, which will certainly be shared in our outputs. So that if you're considering sharing your data, you kind of have a step-by-step -step process that you know you can go through. Then there's open access. So um, Consider sharing your articles in open access journals so that they can be easily accessible. Open education resources, there are a couple of very simple steps that you can take to move into that area. And one is slide share. You know, putting an, a, a Creative Commons license on your slides, making sure the materials that you use are Creative Commons. Uh, and it's quite remarkable and very rewarding what actually happens out of that. So just one example, I did a very simple intro introduction to OER workshop, which was part of this raw for d project. And I've had over 4,000 views on that. So that feels really nice that other people are actually benefiting from this work, not just the, the 30 odd participants from the workshops. Uh, we have an open UCT repository, and I also share materials there. Um, my PhD thesis is available in the open UCT repository for anyone to have a look at. And then this idea of open media and this idea of being networked. Um, and I've just mentioned Twitter as an example. Um, I don't blog a lot like Catherine and other people. Um, it's not, I do blog a little but not a lot, it's not a comfortable media. You have to be comfortable with how you are going to move online. But Twitter has been amazing, working especially with Raw4D, um, especially with Sukena Walji, who has really helped all the researchers to become aware of the power of, of Twitter and the power of being able to share what you have out there. Um, it really has grown, I think, my profile as an academic. Um, and this slide is by Sarah Goodyear. Um, and Sarah has done a number of workshops on open scholarship. And I won't go into, into too much detail because um, I would like to have some discussion time. 
but she actually gives you a little step-by-step -step process, which I think is is quite useful and it's 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 relatively simple. Um, and it's about what are you doing online? What what is there online? Decide what you want to do. You don't have to share everything. You you are in control of what you want to share and where you feel you want to uh, share information and put information out there. What does your profile look like online? And I know Catherine talked about this on Tuesday, about her students, about academics, about building a profile online. And that's your profile you're going to take through your life, whether you like it or not. Our life is just more online, more networked. Uh, these are realities that we have to consider. Um, and then the third aspect is actually improving your output's availability online. And then the fourth aspect is this idea of communicating and connecting. Uh, so this is a model developed by Sarah. This is not my model, but I can see the power of, of um, how useful it is. And that's it from me, just to say uh, this is uh, some hopefully useful links, further links. So the link to Raw 4 d um, has all the different sub-projects, including my own. Um, and it has links to all the outputs. So if you're interested in exploring anything further, um, that's a good place to start. The Open Education Consortium site uh, has a, an amazing array of different institutions that are members, um, an amazing array of different materials available. Then 2017 is the year of Open. And if you're interested in all different aspects of Open, I would suggest that you go and have a look. Uh, what the Year of Open are, are doing is they're having a focus every month on a different kind of Open, so Open Data, Open Science, um, etc. And then if you are situated in Africa, um, OER Africa is also a very valuable source of um, Open Education resources. So that's all from me. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Glenda, thank you very much. That isn't quite all from you. Um, but first, I'd like to start by echoing what Chrissy was saying about this being a very honest account and insightful, to which I'd like to add thorough and potentially highly useful to a lot of other people in different contexts as well. Um, I've gone through the discussion and where I'm trying to harvest some of the points that might um, provoke some thinking and um, might be useful for you to pick up on. One of those was a question from Chrissy in relation to the triangle. Is this a linear construct? I uh, know. Uh, maybe I should go back to the triangle. No, it's not linear, and it's it's quite interesting. In and it's also not um, it's not kind of an equal distribution as well. So what what we found, which is quite interesting. So for example, this idea of permission. Uh, one of the academics who's an open education practitioner is in fact from UNISA. So technically, uh, they really don't have permission to share their official teaching resources. However, this person has gone out of their way to create the most amazing educational videos about different concepts um, that he feels uh, he, he wanted to explore and students struggle with. So you need to have aspects of these factors, um, and it's it's not linear, and it's it's visualized in a triangle because we thought that the triangle would would uh, be useful, but I am we are also aware that it looks kind of like a hierarchy of needs, right? But that's not necessarily what it is. It's got a lot to do with this kind of idea of the externally determined and the internally determined as well. Uh, yeah, I hope that answers your question, Chrissy. Thanks, Glenda. Um, another thing that came out of that triangle and possibly the more um, feedback loop diagram a bit later was the possibility that volition, although you show it at the top of the triangle, also doesn't result in change in organizations 
unless it's also either there right at the very bottom of the triangle or drives down to the bottom to shift the constraints. So this idea of volition, um, in an institution uh, like the University of Cape Town, uh, academics have the agency to share their teaching materials. And from our example, because academic freedom and autonomy is held above all else at UCT, we have found that we have these most amazing champions and almost kind of a, a middle management leadership of, of OER adoption. So depending on this notion of agency, uh, volition can be absolutely key. Uh, and in my PhD, that was what I was working with because of the context of UCT. So it is a very important area. And yes, you're right. I, I, I do, I understand what you're saying, Tony, in terms of if, for example, and perhaps others have this example, uh, let's say, for example, uh, UNISA decide, they have a strategy, but they don't have a policy. But let's say they decide, because it's top down, that everybody has to share a teaching resource. And that is what you have to do as a, as a tick on your resume, performance review. Uh, that would be incredible in a way. It would force people to do it, perhaps for the, the wrong reasons. But you would have this great volume of OER that would actually be out there and shared. So the different ways of looking at this, and it's, as Catherine has also said, it is very complicated, the role of the institution, the role of the agent, uh, and it depends on the institutional culture, uh, who's really powerful in those situations. I hope that helps, Tony. It certainly does, thank you. Um, yeah, Jakob was asking about where you arrived at your characteristics of institutional culture. Is this the schema that was used in articles by Chernovich and Brown some time back? Yes, so um, yeah, Chernovich and Brown uh, used two, actually built on two earlier authors, uh, McNay and uh, Berkwich and Palowick. Uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly at all, um, but uh, they looked at uh, specifically, especially especially McNay, this idea of policy and policy implementation. So in certain institutions, uh, policy and policy impl implementation is very tight. Uh, so that would be more your managerial kind of experience. Uh, like you would get at UNISA, whereas at um, UCT we have a collegial culture where there are policies, but they're not very strictly ad adhered to, um, and this is something that people often find amusing but also resonates, is often a policy is specifically ignored because people don't want to be told what to do. So very different cultures, but the core of that has been around um, this idea of policy. And with policy comes kind of strategic control or top-down approaches. So, yeah, that's the kind of the essence of the characteristics. Ah, and Catherine picked up on that and basically was asking, um, when people from the different institutions read this research, do they agree with the way you've characterized their cultures? Uh, yes, yeah, so we've had, we haven't had, unfortunately, haven't had much uh, feedback from Forte, which was a bit disappointing. Um, but we had um, a critical reader from UNISA uh, go through the work, and and she was, she agreed with the classification, and we've uh, subsequently, Henry and I have spoken to people from UNISA who have felt that uh, it was quite accurate in, in our assessment and, and in the way the process worked. And, and interviewing people, uh, 
this culture becomes quite apparent when you ask them about the importance of policy and adhering to policy. Uh, the culture comes through quite strongly in their responses. Thank you. Francis is asking, could the triangle also apply in similar ways to online teaching and learning resources or perhaps to even open educational practices? Intuitively, that seems to be correct. What do you, th what do you think, Linda? Yes, I think so. Um, I think uh, I think in terms of a change of practice, I think a lot of these areas, if I have a look at it in terms of, let's say, technology adoption, uh, some of them are certainly similar, I would say. Uh, and yes, it definitely the idea of, of institutional culture will also impact on technology adoption. And uh, for example, an institution like the University of Stellenbosch, uh, when they moved more online, uh, there was a mandate that every academic should be online and should have materials on the, um, the institutional VLE. Uh, whereas at UCT, uh, the approach was, if you would like to do it, you can do it. So very different approach, uh, but if people do these things willingly with personal concerns and passion, uh, then often they do them incredibly well. Uh, and that's where we get these um, amazing examples of, of innovation and, um, and truly open practice and also truly innovative practice with um, educational technology when people are actually willing and keen and, and do it out of the goodness, out of their own personal concerns. Yes, and this links directly into a point made by Nicola about lecturer agency, um, suggesting that even in organizations with bureaucratic or managerial cultures, there can be pockets of different institutional cultures at possibly even a departmental level, which may support lecturer agency. Yes, Nicola, that, that is certainly the case, and that, that is what we found at UNISA. Um, we found that uh, yeah, collegial support for that kind of innovation, um, yeah, it supported those individuals who were prepared to go out on a limb and do something a little different. Uh, so, yeah, you with everything, um, I think as researchers we know there are always exceptions um, and with any kind of, you know, an example like this adoption pyramid, uh, it's to be explored, it's a tool that could be useful. We would be really interested to hear if, there, if people found exceptions and, and where the exceptions are in this pyramid, you know, where the points of, of tension are and, and where there are deviations in, in kind of for example, that idea of permission and going against the permission of the institution. Uh, so we're hoping that people will highlight these differences and we can keep working on this model and make it stronger. Yep, picking up on the role of rebels within the system. Um, and Chrissy's wondering about the role of collaboration and also in a recent comment just a few seconds ago about whether people who do good things with OER despite an inhospitable environment are more likely to have good external links outside the... Uh, um, yeah, I think if I, if I look at some of the work from my PhD, there are certainly individuals who are in quite closed departments that despite all that, have this ultimate concern and personal concern, and those terms come from some of the the the, um, the social realism work that I've done. And they will ignore what everybody else does and go out and and share their work. So it's and may not necessarily even have that kind of external support. Uh, so it. Yeah, so the agency, I think, is perhaps my message. The agency aspect is very important. Uh, and that's what I explored in my PhD, was really to understand in situations where 
Academics were not rewarded for sharing OER, did not have supportive colleagues, uh, you know, did not have any resources to an extra time whatsoever to do this, and yet they went and you know, created the most amazing resources and shared those resources. And so, yeah, tried to find a theoretical explanation for that, and it really did come down to uh, personal concerns and agency. Thank you. Um, Yolanda picked up on something slightly different. Thinking about interactive courses that don't have clearly defined resources um, makes her think of the relationship between open educational resources and open educational interaction, conversation, forums, and how they connect to each other, and may perhaps exist even autonomously. Can you say something about that? So I think, um, hi, Yolanda. Um, I think that, uh, so, if we look at these, this idea of becoming an open education practitioner, and we feel that OER is something that is a, a resource, a teaching resource, it could be you know a range of different things. If we open up that definition of, of an open education resource to be a, a model, an image, a, a blog, a, a discussion forum, it is still about sharing openly. Um, so I think I think I would be quite flexible around this idea that if you're sharing ideas openly in a forum, uh, I feel that's the is open practice. It's moving towards open practice and opening up. Uh, so I wouldn't tightly say, well, if you don't share teaching material, that's not that's not good enough, because for some people really. Their interaction in their classroom is is the power of, of how they teach, um, and they don't create uh, wonderful manuals. Um, but yeah, so sometimes when I've spoken to academics like that, they they still struggle to to make that transition to thinking differently about their teaching. And I think Catherine has explored this, where. Uh, she's talked about new models of teaching, a different way of teaching. Um, she could explain it better than I could, but just a different way of thinking about teaching. And, and that is also an important part of, of being an open education practitioner. So, Yolanda, I hope that answers your question. So, yes, open practice uh, can be in different forms. It does not have to be, you know, a beautifully created set of, of a course module or um, something like that. But that helps. Great. Thanks. Thank you, Glenda. The last question we have, I think, is from Ruth, who asks, is OER Africa only for Africans? Might this be a way of disseminating African resources to the rest of the globe? Um, so OER Africa is You'd have to speak to somebody specifically who's there, and I don't know if there's anyone in the room that's from uh, from uh, SADI or OER Africa. I don't think so. Um, as far as I know, they're focused on African content, uh, and I don't necessarily think that that would be the place that you would want to share other teaching materials. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering this very well. So I think it's really, they really have a specific purpose to their materials. Uh, often an institution might have a way of sharing through the institution, but it's also quite possible that you can use a, your own website or create a website. You know, there are enough, a number of different ways of sharing uh, that, that can make your work discoverable. I don't think that was a very good answer, but yeah. So, uh, so who is the who asked that question, and where are you from? Ruth from Commonwealth. Ah, okay. So, so, so Cole would have um, uh, um, websites and and amazing avenues where you could share your material. Uh, and yeah, I think you know, talking to to people like Sanjaya. Uh, Mishra, um, I'm sure that he would be able to um, suggest avenues. I know that they use um, various um, 
Wikipedia type formats in their way that they share their materials. So they've explored a lot of different ways of, of sharing materials. So I think, yeah, if you look a little bit further into, into the coal network, um, you, you should be able to find avenues through coal itself to share. Sorry, sorry, Ruth. Um, apologies sorry, for misrepresenting you. Haha, -ha, okay. <laughs> um, Cedar. Okay, I don't know Cedar in the UK. Sorry, Ruth. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Glenda. I think we're getting close to the end of the session. Um, just a little bit of a look ahead. We're making arrangements with Catherine and Googie of OER Africa for her to do a presentation sometime in the next couple of months, um, given a very busy period that she's involved in currently. Colleagues, um, please put any closing comments in the text chat. And Glenda, you have an opportunity for a closing comment. Uh, yes, I've just I've just made a little note that um, that uh, Catherine Googie is is wonderful to listen to, um, and has tremendous experience uh, through her work with OER Africa. So I would highly recommend attending that session if you're interested in in open education. Uh, she talks a lot about pedagogy and change in pedagogy. So very very interesting work that she does. And yeah, I'd just like to say thank you so much for all of you to, that you've come along and, and spent a whole hour listening to this presentation. And in the true spirit of sharing, please contact me if there, you have any questions. Um, I'm available um, and, and I can be found very, very easily. Uh, so please, please do contact me with any further questions that you might have. And thank you so much, Nicola, Jakob, Tony for organizing the session and giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Glenda, thank you so much for sharing your presentation um, from the research in Raw for D. Um, I think we will be able to glean a lot of um, very usable insights and principles from that for our contexts. Thank you to everybody here for getting yourselves here from um, across different parts of Africa and the world and across all the activities that have pressing demands on your time rather than coming to an Emerge Africa or OER focused seminar. Thanks for sharing your thinking, your insights, your questions and looking forward to seeing you at future events. Bye all.